It's a great honor to have been invited, and it's a great responsibility to, um, to be the one you know, closing this wonderful uh, conference, right? Uh, on the day that we, we, we celebrate uh, CELEP, we, cel we celebrate uh, teachers coming together, and um, we celebrate our birthday, right, um, for CELEP. So it's, a, it's a, a day of joy and celebration for everyone. Right. Um, before I get started, I'd like to, to thank everyone who's um, been involved uh, in, in this project. It, uh, it is testimony to how um, we at CELLEP, um, we can act quickly uh, on the face of, of, of necessity, of, of needs, because this was put together, I guess, in less than 20 days. And um, we've been able to put together um, a wonderful conference. Um, and also, uh, pay tribute to everyone who's been watching us, everyone who's somehow been involved. Um, I think we're living um, a paradoxical um, experience because um, we have to be apart um, uh, now and we've got people from um, um, all, all over the world uh, here from the four corners of the world participating and they're showing us that um, you know, our spirit of, of teachers, of, of coming together, of trying to improve and become better professionals to make sure that we provide our students with the best possible um, classes, uh, it shows that it has no boundaries, right? That no matter where we are, we can come together here with the help of technology and um, try to become better professionals. So thank you to everyone, everyone watching and everyone uh, participating in any capacity, right? Um, now, let's talk a little bit about uh, pronunciation and the importance of, of pronunciation and maybe pronunciation as uh, a component of, of communicative competence, not just linguistic competence. And it's very fitting that I think the last question that uh, the question that Inara was trying to um, head to answer was a question on, uh, on pronunciation. So that leads us uh, nicely to um, what we're doing today. So let me um, share the present make sure show sound here we go yeah so today we'll be talking a little bit about uh, pronunciation as a critical listening skill and uh, I, I know it may sound weird a, a little bit to talk about pronunciation as a listening skill, but um, we'll see uh, in the next uh, you know, 50 minutes, 40 minutes, how um, improving and practicing um, pronunciation and helping our students improve their pronunciation can be critical in helping them also improve their, their listening skills, right? So first, I'd like to um, just talk a little bit about how um, over the, let's say, the last century, um, we've been uh, working with pronunciation in the classroom. So methodological, um, methodological uh, review of um, what we've um, what been doing. I'm not saying here that any, um, any method was any better than any other, right? It's just that um, it's the factual, um, whatever was done at the time when dealing with uh, pronunciation. So um, if we go back all the way back to uh, the direct method, um, their focus was on accuracy. Um, they were relatively intolerant to mistakes, of mistakes. Um, the, the methods they used were, you know, teacher correction, lots of repetition, right? Lots of listening and repeating. Uh, modeling words and modeling phrases, right? Then we move on to well, a big leap, in fact, to audio lingual, right? Over here, uh, again, the focus was on accuracy. They were relatively intolerant of mistakes. Um, lots of, again, teacher correction, repetition drills, uh, language labs, um, a lot of minimal pair drills as well. Um, and we had pronunciation being taught from the very beginning, right? Um, and then uh, along came the silent way, um, and um, uh, the focus was accuracy first, then fluency. And it's the first time we see here um, the word fluency coming into play, right? Um, they were less tolerant of, of mistakes, and there was lots of, they had lots of, you know, uh, bars, sound color charts, you know, the Fidel charts, gestures and expressions to help students uh, learn pronunciation. There was a strong emphasis on accuracy, right? But for the first time, we have the you know fluency coming to play here, right? 
And then we move on to um, community language learning. Again, here, fluency, for the first time, fluency was the number one priority, and then accuracy. So they were somewhat tolerant of, of mistakes. Um, there was lots of teacher correction and repetition here. And um, again, for the first time, it was the learner that decided the degree of accuracy uh, they wanted to work on and was their aim, right? Then um, the natural approach. And finally, we come to the communicative approach where uh, here the, the focus is totally on, on fluency. It's um, obligatory uh, to have fluency here. Accuracy becomes optional, right? Um, very tolerant of mistakes. And uh, the focus was to have the learner engagement in or is to have learner engagement in authentic listening and uh, speaking tasks, right? Um, and um, the idea here is that the communication was adequate enough, right, to, um, uh, to generate communication. And also it is assumed that uh, uh, pronunciation or good pronunciation is a byproduct of appropriate practice over a sufficient period of time, right? So that is a methodological review of how we've treated pronunciation in the classroom um, over the years. Right now, let's talk a little bit about uh, how production and perception are linked. For a long time now, um, we have seen many studies showing that um, production and perception are linked, meaning that uh, maybe the way that a learner of a language produces the language helps them, aids them or not, in the perception of the language um, when they are listeners. Right? And um, again, all the way from the 70s with um, Cat Ford and, and Pisoni, um, uh, the 80s and the 90s, we've seen superior perception when there is better production on the part of the learner. So again, from the 70s, right, again, in the 80s and in the 90s, we have seen time and time again that every time that uh, we were able to um, find better production of the language, and here by production, uh, we mean pronunciation, there was enhanced and heightened perception that is listening in learners, right? And then moving all the way to, um, you know, the 2000s now, in 2007, uh, we have uh, Davis and um, we'll have all the references later. We'll see, uh, Davies came up with uh, something that's called the, the cohort model. So basically he's saying that, um, um, one person or speakers, right, they use sounds to send messages and the receiver of those messages, uh, they try to somehow match these sounds to the words they know, right. Um, he says that um, speech comprehension takes place by continuously processing incoming spoken text as it is heard at all times. Uh, the system processes the best interpretation of presently available input or whatever the listener is receiving at the moment, matching the information in the speech signal to prior lexical and grammatical context. So the word prior here is very, very important, right? Um, so, um, you know, whoever is receiving information needs to have um, knowledge of the message that, that they're receiving, the way, so vocabulary, they need to have it, and also grammatical uh, context. We must not forget that pronunciation is a part of the grammar of, of a language, right? So perhaps if uh, the pronunciation that um, I grew accustomed to, or the pronunciation that I practice is going to help me, um, is going to help me um, understand what people are saying. Okay, and we'll talk more about this when we have time, uh, time for questions uh, in the end. Okay, um, and then um, also a bit, a bit after Davis came up with the cohort model, right? Um, we have Reed um, et al. 2007, so three years later, coming up with something called the, the continual uh, feedback loop, right? So what they suggest here with the continual uh, feedback loop um, is that, um, um, pronunciation on the part of the speaker helps to facilitate their own perception, right? As we can see here, as we as we speak, right, the signals that we are sending out in the into the world to whoever's going to receive that information, um, it loops back to us, 
right? So our own pronunciation feeds our own model of understanding, right? Uh, so what it proposes is that speakers use their own output, their own pronunciation and acoustic representation of the sound as input for their reception and perception. Right. So this goes back to or helps to understand what um, all the way in the 70s with uh, Catford and Pisoni, they were saying where uh, production and perception um, may be linked. And we've seen time and time again uh, studies showing that they are linked, yeah, especially here with the, the feedback loop. OK, now um, I, I know many of us. Um, uh, will have heard and know and are fans of um, Adrian Underhill, right? And he um, is, um, he heavily criticizes how uh, we teachers in the teaching community, we sometimes relegate um, um, pronunciation to um, uh, you know, the back of our concerns in the language classroom. He even talks about uh, pronunciation being the Cinderella of language teaching, right? Because it is neglected right of an excluded of language teaching right because we focus on lexes we focus on grammar right and pronunciation has been uh, uh, cornered right to uh let's say a second tier a second division um in the minds of of uh, teachers and inst institutions we might see though um later today that it might be because we teachers do not receive um appropriate training sometimes uh, on how to teach pronunciation so um, we are not so confident in teaching uh, pronunciation perhaps that is why uh, we neglect it uh, we neglect it or relegate it now um also uh, other reasons why um uh, it is sometimes uh, relegated um in the language classroom um is because um, you know for many years now uh, decades we've seen people like for example uh, in brown in 90 he says that um, we don't need to work on pronunciation so much because uh, normally there's enough contextual information to help the, the listener understand what's happening or what uh, the message they are receiving. Elliot95 went as far as to say that it is the least useful of basic language skills, right? Um, and Fraser talks about uh, teacher training that perhaps we should invest more on uh, teacher training. We, we see, for example, in the CELTA um, teachers uh, book, so the book for those teaching the CELTA course, it says there at some point that um, like other skills, pronunciation will take care of itself and will students will improve it on its own. So we don't have to rush into uh, uh, teaching pronunciation from the very beginning, right? So it's um, something uh, for us to, to think about in the future, right? And then, um there, there's something that we do a lot in the classroom uh, when it comes to pronunciation which is uh, listen and repeat yeah listen and repeat um and how can we go beyond that and we have uh sweeting here so it's misspelled it's uh, sweeting double e not double t i apologize um he says he's actually a, a brazilian uh, researcher and uh, professor living in new zealand and he says that um, uh, listen and repeat is a relic from the audiolingual years, right? So how can we go beyond listen and repeat in the classroom? I'm sure that a lot of our pronunciation practice in the classroom involves listen and repeat. How can we go beyond that, right? How can we help students um, really and truly uh, improve that pronunciation and know what they're doing so that they become more autonomous in the future when working on um, improving their pronunciation? Well, there are many things that we can do. Right, um, and we have desktop um, applications and websites that we can use, and we also have mobile apps that can aid uh, teachers and uh, students alike. Okay, so let's have a look at some of these uh, tools that we have at our disposal. Right, so one thing that we have here is something called um, the, the the interactive uh, phonemic chart. You can see here it's the the british english version but you can have the american english version as well right and um it helps us to um introduce the students to get students to first play with uh, understanding um uh, the phonemic chart right um and um, so in fact um let's have a look at, at a demonstration here
Right. And we'll see here how it works and how um, we can use it in the classroom if we have um, internet connection, for example, in our classrooms, how we can use it to um, introduce the phonemic chart to students. Let's have a look. E, C, ear, hear, th, thing, E, E, O, U, E, A, A, O, A, 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 O, E, A, A, O, O, I, O. Right. And that is under Hill's voice, uh, by the way. Um, now, that can be very helpful, uh, both uh, to us, the teachers, so perhaps we don't have much training uh, in that, so we can learn uh, using that and also uh, to uh, the students, right? Um, we can help students, for example, um, uh, better become better readers of, of good dictionaries, because all good dictionaries also bring the uh, phonemic uh, spelling of words, right? And we also have the app right so the app form that uh, um, students and teachers can download so let's have a look at this e e o w a k truth Sanction. Sanction. Right. So we can have that yeah, sounds, the pronunciation app. It's, it's free and it's a wonderful tool to get uh, students and teachers uh, started in how to uh, understand uh, the, the phonemic chart and uh, the symbols. OK, um, now. Something else that can help us a lot is something called the text to um, phonetics um, website. Right. Um, and as you can see here, right, you can use it to um, copy and paste text right or individual words and then transcribe it right transcribe it to how it would be pronounced it says here online application right that transcribes small english texts right so uh, you can use that as well um, especially if for example you want students to be visualize um, trouble words for brazilians like for example um, the three versions of their right um, whereas uh, Brazilians sometimes have difficulties uh, understanding that um, um, the three words have the same pronunciation. So you can have in a sentence there, over there, with their friends, right? Um, so the, this tool here, and um, in fact, let um, me share a demonstration with you just a second here. Here we go. So, for example, uh, for Brazilians, it's sometimes uh, difficult to, uh, to understand that there is no difference when pronouncing uh, these three different words. They tend, Brazilian students tend to say it as uh, there, uh, there, or something like that, right? Um, and we look and we show students the transcription of uh, the three words. Um, they'll see that um, all three words are pronounced the same in that British pronunciation, there, 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 or you can use um, the, you can change it to general American and you'll have something like there, 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 okay? And um, you can also, um, you know, copy text. Let me copy text from here. Right. Copy text from somewhere any website, right, or from a file that you have. So if there's a student, for example, who has to work on um, a presentation at work, right, so they can use this to, to practice as well, right? And there you go, 
online application that transcribes small English texts, right? Okay. So that is a wonderful, wonderful opportunity. Now, um, and tool to, to use in the classroom if you have um, the chance. So let's go back here. Right. And we also have the same thing uh, on mobile. It's the uh, Tiffonetics and it's uh, free, right? Um, and this is great for students, right? Especially um, at advanced um, students. So let's have a click here to see how it works. Right, so you can type text. And there you go. Right, again, we have the same example with um, there, there, there. And again, students will realize that um, it is the same pronunciation for the three words, right? And you can also copy text from um, other applications um, on your phone. Right, so let's uh, have a look here. There you go, I copy text from um, a website in this case uh, on my phone, copy that, paste it into the app, transcribe it, and there you have it. Okay. No, um, transcribing, right? One might ask, um, why is that important? Well, um, when we transcribe a word or an utterance, we give a direct uh, and specific um, um, message to students on pronunciation for the learner, right? Um, uh, it helps them because it makes them familiar with tr transcription and it enables them to extract precise uh, information from a dictionary, for example. For a Brazilian student, uh, it, it will be great to, for example, have a look at the dictionary and see that uh, the word is pronounced certificate, not certificate, right? If they are a little bit familiar with transcription and uh, the phonemic chart, they will be able to um, use the dictionary and become more autonomous in their learning because they'll visualize, they'll see it. Every time they open a dictionary, the pages are uh, yelling at them and saying, look, this is the right pronunciation in the case of certificate, for example. Okay, and something else um, that we can do uh, to move uh, beyond listen and repeat is to um, get physical with uh, pronunciation, right? Um, and do something uh, called proprioception. It's a concept that comes from uh, medicine Right, um, that we can use as well when um, thinking about uh, pronunciation and teaching pronunciation. And again, we go back to, to Underhill. Now, he says, as pronunciation is primarily a physical activity, a physical and muscular activity, like dance, if you want to learn a new activity in which uh, the required muscular coordination is different from your customary use of, of yourself, then you need to re-educate the muscles. You need to know um, how and where to position your body, for example, right? Um, uh, it, it is, um, I would say, almost impossible to learn to dance, to learn how to dance, just by having other people tell you how to do it, right? But if we um, retrain ourselves, retrain our muscles, retrain our uh, joints, for example, then we might be able to, some um, will have a hard time and they might be able to do a dance routine or do some steps, but they'll never become um, professional dancers or good dancers at all. That would be uh, me as a classic example, right? Um, but we'll become better at, um, at executing the movements that we're trying to execute, right? So proprioception can help us uh, when, um, teaching pronunciation in the classroom, right? And here uh, we have some, uh, again, wonderful desktop and mobile applications that can help us with uh, pronunciation and teaching uh, students. Let's have a look at this here from the BBC uh, Learning English website. So proprioception means being aware of what you're doing with your body as you're trying to create a movement, right? And remember, pronunciation is primarily physical, 
So we need to help students become aware of what they're doing when they're trying to pronounce words, right? And when they're trying to speak or pronounce a difficult uh, sound. Here we go. Let's say a difficult sound for Brazilian sometimes, the E. This is a long vowel sound. It's pronounced E. Now you try. Repeat after me. E. E. Now here are some words which have this sound. Fleece. C. So here we can show the position of the mouth, what the speaker here is doing with the lips, right? Uh, we can see it um, from the front, sideways, right? Um, and, and this can help the student as well. So if you're going to produce this sound, this is what you've got to do, right? So that is what, um, what we mean by um, using um, proprioception, right? And of course we have the website and we also have an app always that can help us with that. And that's the English pronunciation app. Let's have a look. So you choose the sound that you want to practice or the student if they're working on their own. The. So you have diagrams here. The. Right. You have information on how to produce the sound. And even the, the BBC video. This is a voiced consonant. It's pronounced th. Now, did you notice how my tongue sticks out just a little bit as I say it? Watch. There you go. We can stop you here and see the position of the tongue, for example. Th. The sound comes from between my tongue and my top teeth. Th. Now you try. Watch, listen and repeat. Th. Right. So here, of course, there is the repeat bit, um, but we're going beyond listen and repeat because we're telling students, we're showing um, students uh, what they need to do with their bodies as they're, try as they're trying to produce um, that sound. Right. And that is what we mean by proprioception. Right. As we, we move forward, uh, another tool that we can use is uh, something that called the sounds of um, American English. Right. So for those of you um, working on an American model, so let's have a look at that and how this works. Right. So this is wonderful because it's got um, um, very interesting diagrams that can show students what's happening uh, inside their mouths as they're trying to produce a sound, right? So let's um, have a look here that the sound again. Thing. Toothbrush. With. And here what's um, very interesting here is that if you look at the diagram, right, you can see yeah, the tongue moving and you can see the movement of the tongue inside the person's mouth, right? So uh, we, we can show students exactly um, what they need to do with their mouths, lips and teeth as they're trying to produce a sound that is difficult for them. Thing. Toothbrush with. And again, we've got, yeah, as always, we've got the, the. same thing. We've got the same thing uh, as an app, right? We've got uh, the desktop that you can use for free. The app um, is a paid app. It costs about uh, three or four dollars, right? Um, and uh, you've got the exact same tools as the, as the desktop, right? But uh, in your hands if you're using the, the, the app. Right. And now um, moving on to teacher training, it is um, often um, a criticism now, right, from the 2000s that um, we, we do not cover in training courses, we do not cover the most essential aspects of knowledge about speech and pronunciation. So perhaps, right, uh, we should try and uh, get trainers and courses to uh, introduce a bit more work on pronunciation. Um, 
um, for, for teachers because uh, we teachers, especially um, the, the non-native speakers of the language here, yeah, we feel sometimes when you go into the classroom, we don't feel so comfortable and so confident that um, we can truly help students with pronunciation and which is why we still uh, rely a lot on um, listen and repeat in the classroom. Right. Um, another problem here uh, from Pennington and Richards, and that's like more than 30 years old now, 35, I'm not good at maths, years old now, uh, is that pronunciation is traditionally viewed as a component of linguistic rather than um, communicative competence. And when we start looking at it as a component of communicative uh, competence, uh, then um, I think uh, we'll change our approach to teaching pronunciation in the classroom, right? Um, sometimes if we lack the training, uh, we teachers, what do we do? We go after the information, right? So here is a, a wonderful tool from the University of Southampton that uh, you can use. You can get um, help with vowels, consonants, right? Um, aspects of connected speech, tone units, something that um, we don't have the time to discuss today, but tone units as well. Right, so um, something that we can teach ourselves uh, first, how, you know, understand it, and then how to uh, help students um, improve uh, these aspects of their pronunciation. Okay, and does it really, does it really help if, if I work and I help my students with pronunciation, if, if I help them improve their pronunciation, is it really going to help them with their listening skills? Um, um, in 2016, that is the very question that I had um, that I asked myself. So um, I decided to, to run a study and uh, this had a fundamental research question, which was to what extent does the explicit teaching of pronunciation have uh, an effect on learners' scores in the listening component, in the listening component, sorry, of an internationally recognized English proficiency test? long question i know but here we were working with the cambridge ket exam right and what happened was we had uh, two groups of uh, students uh, participating in the study we had a control group and a treatment group the control group they had their classes as usual right not so uh, nothing was done special um, with them, nothing special was done, had their classes as usual, and the treatment group, they had um, their classes as usual, plus uh, six extra hours of pronunciation work throughout their course, yeah, over six weeks. And we tested the students for a, a listening component of a KET exam, a Cambridge KET. We tested the control and the treatment before the this, this study began, Right? and also after the study began. Remember that only the treatment group received um, extra tuition on pronunciation. Right? And we can see that um, <clears throat> in the post-test, right, after the second test, uh, the treatment group improved uh, their performance on average by almost 10%, whereas the control group, surprisingly, their performance on the second KET, uh, KET test was actually worse than the first time after six weeks. So here we can see that um, teaching students pronunciation may indeed help them improve their listening skills uh, because again, they'll uh, use a model of pronunciation that's much closer to an internationally recognized um, uh, good model. And uh, then they can use that and they'll use that to better comprehend uh, listening input. Okay. And, and you can see that, you can see the results, the full results of that study uh, in uh, Speak Out yeah, from the Aya Temple's Pronunciation Special Interest Group, uh, number 56. Right. And, um, you know, but is it really, is it really a component of, of communicative competence, not linguistic competence? Well, it can be. And it is sometimes, right? And we're going to have a look here at an exaggerated, um, exaggerated example of how it is a component of communicative competence. But it goes to show how important it is when we're trying to communicate. Let's have a look at this video here, right? And I got the message that some people might not be hearing uh, the audio, but I'm sharing with sound, so hopefully um, you'll be able to hear this. So let's have a look. 
Das hier ist mein Sektor. Das hier ist das wichtigste Gerät des Küstenwächters. Das Gerät und das Gerät. Überlebensradar. Mayday, Mayday. Hello, can you hear us? Can you hear us? Can you... Okay, over. We are sinking. We are sinking. Hallo? This is the German Coast Guard. We are sinking. We're sinking. What are you thinking about? So here, right, we have a reminder that the officer, uh, the Coast Guard officer, uses his own model of pronunciation, yeah, for the word, not word, word, thinking, to interpret what is heard, right? So because uh, for him, uh, the word thinking or think is pronounced as sink, sinking, right? Um, so when the, the British ship says or sends out a mayday saying they're sinking, the ship is going down, right? The officer understands that they're thinking about something. Again, it's an exaggeration, right, of pronunciation as a component of uh, communicative competence, but it goes to show that uh, it, it can be, and it is, um, uh, a component of of a component of communicative competence, right? And um, so, what I'd like us to try to move on in the future is to um, we talk a lot about intelligibility in the language classroom, where you know students have to you know to be intelligible. So perhaps if we think about uh, pronunciation as a component of communicative competence, we have to think of a new term, uh, inter-intelligibility, where learners' speech is understood and serves as a perception model to guarantee their own listening comprehension, right? So um, in the classroom, yeah, to work a bit more on, on pronunciation, really help the student uh, or students to make sure that, uh, of course, they are understood, but perhaps um, our final goal, our most important goal, is to, um, as they are understood, that also they'll be able to understand others. It's very common that we hear from our students. We say, you know, teacher, I understand when I'm speaking English to other Brazilians and there are other Brazilians in uh, the conversation, I understand everything they're saying. Right. But when I'm talking to people of other nationalities or native speakers, it's harder for me. And that goes to show that, well, because here we have Brazilians communicating with Brazilians, um, they share the same model, the same internal model of communication. Right. Because we're all speakers of, of Portuguese. So most people share that model and which is why it's easier to understand um, a, a Brazilian speaking English than if you are Brazilian, then to understand, for example, um, a, a Canadian speaker of English or a British speaker of English or an Australian speaker of English.